Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the good news of the gospel. And we pray that on this Good Friday, you will help us to see and to know and to love all that is true and all that is good. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The message of the cross is foolishness. Do you know who wrote that? That was the Apostle Paul in a letter to the church in Corinth. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The sentence goes on. To us who are being saved, he writes, it is the power of God. In other words, two people could look at the exact same thing, Jesus dying on the cross, and one could see it as foolishness, just like weakness, defeat, utter devastation and destruction, and they would walk away from him. Another could look at the exact same thing and be utterly and eternally transformed by it. So the question for you today is how do you see the cross of Christ? What does it look like to you? Now, there are some moments in life that you know will stick with you for the rest of your days. Often they're deeply personal and important mainly to you. So like your wedding day, for example, or when you first held your child, when you got that job offer or closed on that house. It might even be a sermon that you heard or a sunset that you saw or a concert that you attended or a conversation that you had. Some things are deeply personal and important to you. And you know at the time that they will remain with you until the day you die. There are other things that stick with you, not because of their personal importance, but because of their kind of global significance, the difference they make to the world we live in. So I reckon everyone who was alive on September the 11th, 2001, will remember where they were when they heard the news of the attack on the World Trade Centers. You probably remember seeing those horrifying images. You probably remember the, the sort of dawning realization that the world we live in has been changed. There are probably loads of examples of uh, moments of cultural significance that united the whole world together. Um, declarations of certain wars or the resolution of certain wars were moments that united millions of people together and will have changed the world. Of course, at the forefront of our minds at the moment, the coronavirus. For the rest of our days, probably, we will remember this period of time when the world shut down, when the schools were closed, when church went online, when Joe Wicks became the world's PE teacher. Without a doubt, um, the moment of greatest cultural impact, the moment of greatest global impact, the moment of greatest spiritual impact is the event that we remember on Good Friday. Even non-Christians, even anti-Christians, the agnostics and the atheists would all agree that the single event that had the biggest impact on the history of the world was the event of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But why? On a hill outside Jerusalem dies a man in his early 30s. He's um, riding into town at the start of the week, and by the end of the week, he's dead and buried in the ground. It seems like such a small, insignificant, um, unimpressive, unimportant kind of story, right? Uh, in terms of the, the world stage. Who is this man? He's the son of a carpenter. He was born in a barn. He was nailed to a cross to die. And yet, billions of people call him their king. What is going on here? What is going on at the cross that is so significant that Billions and billions of people have sought to follow in his footsteps and call him their God for the centuries past. More artwork over the last 2,000 years has been about him than any other individual, living or dead. More poetry about him than any other subject. More songs about him than any other topic. 
his followers in Jesus' name have started schools and universities and hospitals and charities. They have traversed the globe with Bibles in their hands and joy in their hearts, all for the hope that someone will hear of the good news of the gospel, the hope they have in Jesus. Some have been beheaded on beaches for bearing his name. Some have been torn to pieces in the Colosseums for refusing to recant. Countless people over the centuries have declared, this is the death of Christianity, and yet every day, thousands of men, women, and children put their faith in Jesus. Something happened on that hill outside Jerusalem. The world has never been the same since. How do you see the cross of Christ? What does it look like to you? To some people, it means the world. There's a fascinating bit in the book called Life of Pi, where uh, the main character, Pi Patel, who was raised in a Hindu Hindu background, um, starts to encounter the teachings of Christianity. And he cannot get his head around the fact that the, the God, the creator of all people, should die at the hands of the people he created. It's, it's scandalous to him. He says, this is from the book. I couldn't imagine Lord Krishna consenting to be stripped naked, whipped, mocked, dragged through the streets, and to top it off, crucified at the hands of mere humans to boot. I'd never heard of a Hindu god dying. It is wrong, he says. Why would God wish that upon himself? Why not leave death to the mortals? Why make dirty what is beautiful and spoil what is perfect? On the surface, it looks like foolishness to the world, doesn't it? Um, One of the very earliest surviving depictions of the Lord Jesus Christ is some ancient graffiti that was scratched on the wall in Rome around the year 200 AD. This is a picture of it. Uh, It's hard to make out, but the picture is a mockery of the Lord Jesus Christ. The inscription reads, Alexamenos worships his God. The idea of God dying at the hands of men would seem by many to be utter foolishness. And yet, billions of people have built their lives upon this foundation. Now, when Jesus is dying on the cross, there are crowds and there are soldiers and there are mourners and there are weepers too. But there are two people who have a better vantage point from which to watch these events unfold than any other. And they are the thieves being crucified on either side of Jesus. And interestingly enough, we see each of these reactions, foolishness versus the power of God, being displayed in each of these two criminals. One reviles Jesus and the other comes to revere him. One curses him and the other cries out to him in faith. Reading from verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him, that is Jesus, to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And the people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. Okay, so Jesus is on the cross, dying for the sins of his people. He's in unspeakable physical and spiritual agony. And then we see people decide to throw insults at Jesus on top. It's kind of interesting that we see the exact same insult come up three times in a row from three different groups of people. He saved others, let him save himself. Um, We just read it from the rulers and religious leaders in verse 35. Uh, They've been looking for a Messiah, and they think, of course, no self-respecting son of God is going to end up dead on a cross, and therefore they sling insults at him. 
That's the first one. But then you have the soldiers, and in their mind, the greatest power and authority is that of a king. And then they look at this man, and they think, well, he couldn't be anything further from what a king of power ought to be. Verse 36, the soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine, vinegar, and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. You see that same idea come up again. But they're not the only groups hurling insults at Jesus. And most tragically, I think, there is this third voice, a third perspective, a third person who believes that the cross is nothing but foolishness and shamefulness and utter devastation. Verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. It's the same idea again. Notice just briefly what they are all saying with one voice. We know what wisdom looks like. We know what power looks like. We know what victory looks like. And it doesn't look like this. So one of the criminals turns to Jesus and says, aren't you the Messiah? Is this what victory looks like? Save yourself and us. Now this could almost seem like a a kind of desperate attempt to plead with God to be rescued from this agonizing death. I mean, that would be quite reasonable, wouldn't it? If you or I were being crucified and we knew that we only had to call out to know that we were being heard by the Messiah, the Son of God, who has the power to change this situation, we might well ask to be saved, either from death or from the pain of crucifixion. Save me, Lord. I know you can. If ever there were a time, Lord, for the thunder to roll and the heavens to split open and the angels to descend and the destruction of the Romans to begin, it would be now, Jesus. What are we doing here? Rally the forces of heaven to save the Son of God. What are you waiting for? Doesn't this just show that you were a fraud and a liar all along. There is no way God will allow the Messiah to come to an end like this. The thief effectively says, look, if you are the Christ, if you are the Savior, if you are the long-awaited Messiah, then use your power to get me off the cross and then I will know, then I will believe, then I will trust that you are the Son of God. Have you ever tried to make that kind of deal with God? Have you ever said, God, if you do just this one thing for me, then I will know that you are real. Then I will know that you are powerful. Then I will know that you love me if you give me just this one thing. Maybe you've found yourself in a desperate situation. Probably not as desperate as this guy, but in any case, a time when you're aware that you have no real power to change the course of events. Maybe you've said something like this, God, if you are real, and if you have this much power, then use your power to do what I know you should do. (laughs) Then I'll believe that you are God. This is his logic. This is how he's thinking. I know how my life ought to go. I know the best way forward. And if there is a God, then he knows it too. And so if my life does not go forward in the way I think it ought to, well, I can conclude there is no God or God is mean and wicked and evil and spiteful because he did not help me in the way that I demanded. When we think like that, what we're saying is, I believe that there might be a God who is more powerful than me. He can do more than me, but I can't conceive of a God that is more clever than me. You see that? There might be a God who's more powerful than me, but I can't believe that there's a God who knows more than me. As Christians, we need to get hold of this truth. Not only is God more powerful than us, but he's also more knowledgeable than us. If we could see what he sees, if we could know what he knows, we would not doubt his decisions or second guess his actions. When God does something that we might not do, it is not because he is lacking in knowledge, but because we are. There is something going on that this criminal doesn't see. And there's something going on in the world that we do not see. 
Can Jesus hear this man's request? Yes. Can Jesus grant this request? Yes. Could he come down from the cross and ride off into the sunset at any moment he chooses? Yes. He could have ended the pain at any point and yet he chose to remain. The criminal wanted Jesus to spare his life, but Jesus was offering to save his soul. And not just his, of course, but the souls of billions of people throughout the centuries and around the world who have put their trust in Jesus. Yes, he could have gotten him off the cross. He could have saved the two criminals and himself. But what a desperately small view of salvation that is. Then what? What happens next, do you think? The criminals would live for another, what, 10 20, 30 years, and then they'd have to die and answer to God for their violent, sinful lives. He stays exactly where he is, not because he can't save himself, but because he came to save them. This is the only way to do it. Jesus remains exactly where he is, not because he is weak, but in fact, because he is strong. It's worth saying that this first criminal here, he's making this request, but we know for a fact that this is an insincere request. How do we know that? Well, we're told, actually, in verse 39, he was hurling insults, plural, at Jesus. This is just one of many insults. This is designed to provoke him, designed to hurt him. This is one of the many insults this criminal throws at Christ. I mean, just think about that for a moment. I mean, this criminal here has blood flowing out of the wounds in his hands and his feet. He has just hours left to live. His body is racked with agony. His strength is draining out of his muscles. He is flitting in and out of consciousness. And yet he uses the little strength he has to mock the man dying by his side. (sighs) Isn't that incredible? He sucks in air to fill his collapsing lungs and then uses that precious oxygen to spit venomous insults at Jesus. Can you imagine using your dying breath to curse the God who made you, the only one who can save you? This man did not love Jesus in life and will not be with Jesus in the life that is to come. The criminal on the other side, though, He has a different story. Verse 40. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? Now this is a remarkable turn of events. We read in Matthew and Mark's Gospels that when the crucifixion began at around nine o'clock in the morning, both criminals were hurling insults at Jesus. They were both part of the, the mocking blasphemy. And yet as the day has gone on, one man's eyes have begun to open. He's begun to see the fact that um, Jesus is who he claims to be, despite the fact that no miraculous intervention has materialized. In Romans 2 verse 4, we read this, the kindness of God leads us to repentance. And it seems that the kindness of God has been experienced by this criminal It has led him to repentance. As far as we know, he's not heard a parable and he's not seen a miracle and yet he repents. What has he seen in Jesus? Well, we know this much. He's seen incredible kindness. Jesus has been through the most brutalizing, agonizing, dehumanizing experience imaginable. He is suffering with all that the first criminal suffered from and so much more on top of it. He has been whipped and beaten and spat at. He wears a crown of thorns in his head and his beard has been ripped from his face. He's been through so much more and yet the two could hardly be any more different. One is filled with hatred and the other is filled with love. The crowds have mocked and jeered for hours and Jesus has continually, unendingly responded with love and grace, and get this, the offer of forgiveness. He would have been well within his rights as the God of the universe, the king of all kings, to look down upon those who are trying to end his life 
and say to them, yeah, I'm going to stay here because I'm paying for the sin to the world. But just so you know, I will get even with you. This is going to cost you. I will judge you for this. And yet they aren't the words on his lips in this moment. Verse 34, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The second thief has watched all this take place and has clearly been blown away by Jesus' offer of forgiveness, even for his enemies. And so it seems he grows silent in his mockery of Jesus. Uh, God has opened his eyes and renewed his mind. He started to see the glory of the situation. There is a transformation going on inside him until at last he refuses to stay silent. Notice, um, he is the lone voice defending Jesus at this time. Nobody else is speaking up on behalf of Jesus. And yet here he is speaking up against the crowd, speaking up against the criminals. None of his disciples are saying a word in his defense. They've run off in hiding. And yet this man says, don't you fear God? We are being punished justly. We are getting what our sins deserve. But hear me on this. This man is innocent. He has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Isn't that incredible? The first thief said, in effect, if you get me off this cross, then I will be on your side. The second one said, I will stay on this cross if at the end of it I can be on your side. Isn't that interesting? The first thief says, if you spare me this pain, then I will believe in you. The second one says, I believe in you. And so I will put up with the pain. This man has understood the gospel. In fact, what he says next proves it. He says this, we are being punished justly. We are getting what our deeds deserve. And then he turns to Jesus and he says, effectively, I believe you. I believe that you are the king of kings. I believe that you have done nothing wrong. I believe that you are a king coming into a kingdom on the other side of death. And I don't know how it works, and I don't know when you'll get there, but Jesus, I'm begging you, when you come into your kingdom, do you think there might be room for someone like me? Will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And the answer, we would think, would be a resounding No, he doesn't deserve it. Of course, he's not appealing on the basis of what he deserves, but on the basis of what Christ has done. He's got it. He's seen it. He's understood the gospel. What would make him think he should even bother asking this question, knowing who he is and knowing who Jesus is? Where on earth has he got this idea from that sinful people can go to a sinless eternity, that thieves like this can go to a place like that? Follow this with me. Does he know that he's guilty? Yes, Absolutely, he is guilty and deserving of death. Does he know that Jesus is perfect? Yes, absolutely. He is innocent of all wrongdoing, but more than that, he's a king and will come into a kingdom of his own on the other side of death. And get this, the criminal believes that he might be able to join Jesus in that kingdom simply on the basis of asking Jesus. He's not appealing to his own good works. He's not saying, I've been seriously misunderstood. He's not saying, oh, but life is just so unfair. He's saying, I was guilty, guilty as can be. But Jesus, even so, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? He is asking to go to glory, not on the basis of his own good works. He hasn't got any. He's asking to go to glory, not on the basis of his goodness, but on the basis of the goodness of God. Not on the basis of his performance, but on the basis of Christ's. He's understood something here that many people never will. Listen carefully to this. God does not save religious people, but repentant people. 
God does not save religious people, but repentant people. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. This man is a vile offender and he knows it. And yet he truly believes and he asks Jesus to save him. Jesus looks at him with love in his heart and effectively says, I will take the punishment your sins deserve. I will take the wrath from God that your sins have stored up for you. Friend, when you get through this, when you step through this curtain of death and open your eyes on the other side, you will see that there is no sin left for you to pay for. There is no punishment left for you to bear. I have taken it all. I paid your debt. The punishment you deserve has landed on me and the righteousness that I have earned has been given to you as a gift. Today, my friend, you will be with me in paradise. So what next? Did this man give to charity? No. Did he go to church? No. Did he even get baptized? No. Did he give money? No. Is he a good man? No, not by a long shot. He has nothing to offer at all, nothing at all to give, nothing to build his life on or put his hope in other than the goodness and grace of God. Maybe the same is true for you. If you have messed up in your life, if you have let people down, if you have turned away from the God that you once loved, then look to that wretched thief on the cross and know this with all your heart. There is no one who has gone too far that the hand of God cannot reach them. There is no one who has sinned too much that the love of God can no longer save them. Jesus laid down his life for you. Jesus holds out his hand for you. Jesus offers grace and love and forgiveness and acceptance to you today, right now. Jesus is saying to you, put your trust in me. And no matter what happens in this life, no matter how badly wrong things seem to go, you will be with me in paradise. No one has sinned too much. No one has gone too far. Nobody has sunk too low. Jesus has died for your sins in your place so that instead of punishment from God, you might receive everlasting peace. So won't you take him up on it? Won't you receive that forgiveness? Won't you repent of your sin in all your imperfection? Won't you be like that thief who cried out to God, Lord, will you save me? Even now, remember me, even though I've fallen short, even though I'm not good enough on my own. Will you take my sin away? Will you forgive me for my wretchedness? Will you save me? Will you transform me? Will you take me to be with you in glory? If you say to God in repentance and faith, remember me when you come into your kingdom and you actually mean it, then he will. By his death, on the cross, in your place for your sins. He has the power to forgive you of your sins and change your eternal destiny. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the very power of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you so loved the world, that you gave your one and only son, that whoever Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but enjoy eternal life with him in paradise. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.